the next speaker coming to the stage is somebody who has dedicated his life to educating people about science. I feel silly reading an introduction for this person. <laughs> he has a passion for teaching people and is a fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, whose mission is to promote scientific inquiry, critical investigation, and the use of reason in examining controversial and extraordinary claims. Um, you've seen him debate the worst of the worst with like, I got this, mic drop, see ya. Um, and I also just recently saw an incredible video of him talking about reproductive rights, why, why reproductive freedom is so important, the science behind it, and it was so inspiring. So please, let me introduce you with pride, the one and only, Bill Nye. Oh, wow, greetings. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Wow, hello, hello. Wow, greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for including me. It's an honor to be here. I am a native Washingtonian, and I am, I am as proud of this city as I've ever been. Ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, skeptics, non-theists, and especially the believers who may be here. As we stand before this shrine to one of history's most thoughtful, critical thinkers, Abraham Lincoln, I cannot help but feel that we are at a critical time, a turning point in the history of my beloved United States and the history of humankind. Our ability to reason has helped us provide clean water, reliable electricity, and access to an electronic information infrastructure to a large fraction of the people who live in the developed world. Critical thinking, reason, and science got us here. And these traditions will help us bring these technical advantages to everyone on Earth, and dare I say it, change the world. With these noble goals in mind today, citizens around the globe are dealing with enormous costs and extraordinary hardships associated with rapidly rising waters and weather events of the extreme kind. We have floods in Texas, terrifying windstorms in the central United States, flooding in southern Germany and France, the River Seine in Paris, the very city that hosted the most recent conference of the party's climate summit. There were 193 parties in attendance, all hoping to work together to resolve this global scale problem of atmospheric and oceanic warming, climate change, that has been heretofore largely ignored by most of us in the United States. Through our enterprises, we have loaded the Earth's atmosphere with carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases that are warming our world 10 to the sixth one million times faster than it has ever warmed in its four and a half billion year history. Humankind has brought this on. Humankind must address it. But today, our efforts have barely begun. As an engineer and citizen of the United States, I cannot help but wonder why this is. Why is this country, which for over a century was the world leader in science, engineering, and innovation, not the world's leader in the renewable energy technologies and especially the carbon curtailing policies that we must create and put in place as soon as we can. Right on, and thank you. Apparently, a handful of climate change deniers has managed to hoodwink us to lead us to believe that there is some doubt among, among the overwhelming majority of scientists about the seriousness and consequences of global climate change, even as our rivers overflow their banks. Without thinking much about it, we allow climate deniers to equate routine scientific uncertainty, plus or minus 2 percent, let's say, with doubt about all the observable global changes altogether 
that would be the equivalent of plus or minus 100%. Now, when I express the situation this way, everybody agrees that 100 is somewhat larger than 2. And we all can see that the deniers are obviously wrong or very much misled. The deniers often suggest that there is a worldwide conspiracy of scientists out to drive coal miners out of work. A conspiracy, really, of 30,000 scientists? Have you ever hung out with these people? <laughs> that is simply not reasonable. Yet a large fraction of us has gone along with deniers, hardly questioning their inane argument and obstructionist policy proposals. Furthermore, climate denial is generational. Very few young people embrace these silly ideas. But what about the future, the kids? I'm not kidding. We cannot let them down. Now, things change. The world changes. My grandfather went into World War I on a horse. He was, by all accounts, a skilled horseman. He rode around trenches in the dark and under enemy fire. But very few soldiers today need that particular skill. Today, the tasks and jobs needed to conduct a war have changed. In analogous fashion, a great many jobs will change. People in the extraction industries, those who mine coal or drill for oil and gas today, will one day soon be doing something else in the energy sector, welding wind turbine mass, manufacturing photovoltaic systems, or connecting neighbors to the internet. We can do this, everyone. We can change the world. In a month, a consortium of for-profit and not-for-profit organizations will open an amusement park with a religious theme in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. You may have heard about their activities. The Answers in Genesis ministry preaches that the discovery of evolution was and is somehow not real, and more urgently, they insist that our world is not warming. They promote this fiction among their followers that we have nothing to worry about. To work at their creation museum or at their soon to open Ark Encounter Bible literal theme park, you have to testify to your faith in their faith. That might seem like a violation of the First Amendment, which, by the way, you can read for yourself uh, the original text. It's just a few blocks from here in the east at uh, the National Archives. And to finance these attractions, the organization apparently relies on a consortium of legal entities. The Answers in Genesis Consortium claims religious affiliation when it comes to discrimination in hiring. It relies on Crosswater Canyon Incorporated, a not-for-profit not -for entity they claim will attract tourists to the area and thereby be entitled to tax breaks and virtually free real estate from Kentucky and her taxpayers. While the entities of the consortium have passed legal tests in Kentucky, they did so because the governor, the tourism cabinet members, and a key judge are all believers. They accept that their religion is not separated from their state or commonwealth, as it would be under other circumstances. Now, I'll give Kentuckians a critical thinker's example. Imagine if the consortium were about to open something like the mosque kiosk, an amusement park or tourist attraction designed to promote the Muslim faith. Such a project would be quashed at once by the very same officials who are enabling these biblical businesses to thrive. To those of us here at the Reason Rally doing our best to be reasonable, this would otherwise be a charming, if silly, bit of Americana something foreigners would shake their heads at, something people in Kentucky universities and colleges in the surrounding area would apologize for continually. And that would be about that. However, there is something very much more at stake here, the future. I'm talking about the kids. If we raise a second generation of people within driving distance of these facilities, Kentuckians, Ohioans, Illinoisans, Indianans, West Virginians, and Tennesseans that cannot think for themselves, we are all going to pay the price. We are all going to be burdened with re-educating and enlightening these kids and young adults. 
And just think about the economy in those areas. The workers in these nearby communities will not have been brought up with the philosophical traditions, the process of science and reason that help us all understand the world. I am certain the kids will not grow up with the tradition of innovation we and others expect from our citizens who create search engines, smartphones, and electric sport cars. I say this because along with this consortium's weird lack of understanding of biology, geology, and astronomy, this consortium promotes the idea that the world is not warming, that a deity will ensure that everything is fine, despite the overwhelming, astonishing, and very troubling evidence to the contrary. So while it is a good feeling to be among like-minded people here at this rally, there are troubles ahead unless we act this year. I claim, and I encourage you all as good skeptics, to please evaluate my claim for yourself. But I claim that this year is a turning point for us, for us humans. If we stumble forward and elect a climate change denier to be the United States President, along with a cohort of deniers in other government roles, the entire world is headed for big global warming climate change trouble. If we delay another four, or worse yet, eight years, it will be difficult indeed for millions of us to ever achieve a quality of life that you and I have come to expect in the 21st century. And by the 22nd century, virtually all of humankind could be suffering deeply. So as this summer of 2016 unfolds, I acknowledge the possibility that an insecure, confused, and currently conservative man may, by reluctant default, become the most influential man on Earth in January of next year. If this happens, I'm sure a strong majority of us, conservative and progressive alike, would be very, very concerned for our future. So what would we do? Well, over the last few weeks, I've often reflected on a joke that we used to share at Boeing. I used to work at Boeing on 747s. Don't worry, I was very well supervised. And the joke went like this. It was about the fictional B-3 bomber. Now, the B-3 bomber has a one pilot and a pit bull. The pilot is there to watch the instruments, and the dog is there to make sure that pilot doesn't touch anything. So if the current conservative presumptive nominee gets elected in November, I have a feeling we will all have to work like pit bulls to make sure that when it comes to the U.S. government, he doesn't touch anything. So everyone, I, I say this often enough. You have to vote. For those of you who don't want to participate, who are cynical about voting, who feel that our choices uh, are not good enough for you and your vote, would you please just sit down and shut up and let the rest of us who want to participate, who want to influence the future, get out there and vote. Everybody this year, no matter what happens, please take the environment and climate into account when you vote. Now, with all this, I acknowledge that we here at this gathering are in the minority, a small minority. Although the fraction of our society that embraces reason over unreasonable claims, that embraces critical thinking over baseless anecdote, and science over anti-science, we are growing. But we must accept, we must keep in mind that we are a minority, underdogs in the fight for reason. Now, when my grandfather was a young man, there was no national airport. <laughs> And by the way, I hope that someday soon we have renewable energy for those aircraft, either from, uh, from uh, uh, oil-based products made from plants or from maybe hydrogen turbines made from water. I see some young people here. I want you to get on that and change the world. And if you pull it off, there's a very good chance not only will you have changed the world, but you'll get rich. So get out there. Now, when my grandfather was a young man, 
There were fewer than one and a half billion people on Earth. When I was a kid, there were fewer than three billion. As I stand here before you today, there are 7.3 billion. And the overwhelming majority of these, six billion at least, four times the number of people that were in the world when my grandfather was a kid, are deeply religious. But it is no trouble to find common ground, everyone. When the environment of the Earth is at stake, we can all work together. The Pope's recent encyclical stands out as a common sense assessment of our planet and its future. And as I often say, if you like to worry about things, you are living at a great time. <laughs> we have suicide bombers, deadly drone missions, and now the Zika virus. It's very reasonable, by the way, that more than a few of us have been infected here today. I'm not kidding. But it's also a time in which we could be very optimistic. Reasonable studies by engineers and policy analysts have shown that there is enough renewable energy available to run all of this country, to run our neighbors to the north and south, and even the entire world, if we just decided to do it, to go renewable with existing technologies. The sources of energy would be wind, concentrated solar, photovoltaic electricity, with some thermal and tidal thrown in. And the big potential source of energy here in the eastern time zone, by the way, is wind off of our east coast. We could do it if we just decided to get her done. And for those of you who may be very skeptical of this claim, I give you this critically thought through example. Both of my parents were in World War II. Their ashes are interned across the river in Arlington National Cemetery, side by side. My father was a prisoner of war, captured very early in the war from Wake Island in 1941 by the Japanese military. My mother, who was very good at puzzles, I'll give you that, was recruited to work on the notorious Enigma Code. I had nothing to do with it. They were both part of what came to be called the greatest generation. They did not set out to be part of the greatest generation. They did not set out to be great. They played the hand they were dealt. And in five years, they resolved a global crisis. So must we. We must employ critical thinking and our powers of reason to recognize the problems of global climate change, to play the hand we are being dealt, and to get to work. This summer, let's all work to promote reason. Let's remind our fellow citizens that each and every vote matters. Let's acknowledge and embrace the facts of global climate change. Let's go. With critical thinking and reason, we can find common ground. We can promote policies to reduce carbon emissions. We can develop and distribute what we need to provide clean water, reliable electricity, and access to electronic information to everyone on Earth. My friends, together, we can, dare I say it, change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you. better than Bill Nye. It's so awesome, oh, hitting every point that is so important. The thought of not voting when the options are Captain Word Salad and anyone else is just shocking to me.